Next up, we have working with the man, thinking through paperwork and planning. We have Eli Peterson, who is our, what is your title? Program Services Manager, sorry, I didn't memorize that. Um, he helps, he's gonna be moderating because he knows a lot of sort of like the legal uh, back-end support for the artists. And we have Lightning Clearwater III, who is our chief lawyer for, le chief legal advisor for Burning Man. And then we have Maria Partridge, who helps with the self-funded projects. So we're going to have them join us for a panel up at the front. And uh, we're excited to have you guys. I stole your mic. Here's the yellow. Hey everybody. Here's the red. Oh, here we go. Thank you so much, Roxy. Um, this is my first time being in the Grand Theater, and I'm really impressed with what Gray Area has done to turn this this space around. It's really wonderful to see this this great old theater in, in good shape again. So, big big appreciation to Josette and Gray Area. Um, so that was just a lovely, very high level. What what can art do in cities? Um, introduction to what we're here for, and now we're going to go all the way down to the very, very base uh, level of paperwork and permitting and contracts and all of the unpleasant stuff that you have to do to get to that wonderful, amazing high level that Kim and Josette were talking about. Um, so with me I have Maria Partridge, um, and Maria is uh, was born and raised in Reno, lives in Reno, um, teaches art at the college level there. She's been working with the Artery on Playa for 10 years. Um, most recently is the artist advocate um, who manages all the processes for the um, unfunded um, art projects, which is the majority of the art projects on Playa, it turns out. Um, she's also been working on civic art projects in Reno with uh, Crimson and with, with BRAF for um, a number of years as well. Um, did a number of civic art, public art projects there, mostly pieces that had been on Playa. Um, also it, with me is Lightning Clearwater III. Um, he was Burning Man's original outside general counsel, um, currently on the board of directors for the Burning Man Project. Also was the general counsel for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, working on some, some really cutting edge constitutional law and with technology issues there. Um, he's also a Playa artist um, with the Attic Oasis in 2011, the Pistol and the Man Base in 2012, the Temple of Holiness, which you saw up on the screen there. Um, and uh, with uh, co-artists uh, Melissa Barron and Greg Fleischman. So welcome, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks. Thank you. So um, I'm going to start off. I think the format we're going to do is um, we'll talk about different topics. We, you know, if there are any questions, you can you know, sort of ask them at any time during the presentation and see where we can go with. Um, you know, I mean, essentially, um, and for any of you who have ever put art you know, in the city or, or contracted with a private place, you probably know a lot of these, the, the answers that we're gonna have, which is basically when you're contracting with any municipal entity, you get a contract that has incredibly onerous terms and you don't have very much choice but to comply with most of them. The good, the good part, if it's the good part, is that most of the concerns can be dealt with by one simple thing, which is money. The more money you have, you can very easy to comply with them. Luckily, that's next session. We don't have to deal with that issue here, how you get the money. Um, but the, I think the basic topics we're gonna deal with will be safety, insurance, and liability, intellectual property, sort of payment, um, you know, protection of the artwork, damage to the artwork, termination and then permits and ADA issues. Okay, so I'll sort of start with sort of the, the you know, the basic issue, you know, with, with respect to safety and liability. I mean, essentially any contract you're gonna have is going to make you responsible for, you know, any, any safety or any damage or liability issues. And um, so, I mean, that means a number of things. It means you've got to focus on making sure the, the artwork is safe. In, in fact, most of the contracts you're gonna have are gonna require you to have um, drawings that have been approved, you know, got the red stamp by an engineer. And which, I mean, obviously that can be dealt with 
one by you know your engineering and number two by money and you know the money may be in engineering your you know artwork that perhaps might be stronger than you've already done but it's the amount of money for you know for paying for the engineers i mean for, for example when you know greg and you know and i, I were building our the odic oasis for example we were when we first started doing it, we were trying to figure out, okay, what, what engineering testing are we going to do? And so we ended up, you know, talking to some engineer, and he quoted us some huge amount of, you know, some dollars of what it's going to take to get a red stamp, you know, him to analyze us and do the red stamp. Instead, we went to him and said, look, just tell us what tests you were going to do. We'll do them ourselves. You can come down and look at them and just tell us if you think it's okay. Because for the playa, we didn't need the red stamp. You know, any place else, we're going to have to spend the, the ten thousand or more for you know that engineer to be able to do that. Can I say something? <laughs> so that said, um, Crimson and I have placed a lot of work in Reno, and um, we basically, I basically chased answers as the questions came up, as the city presented them to us, and um, what has happened is that um, it. I think what I'm going to suggest to everybody is that you have your own kind of artist advocate and you talk to people in the city and you ask questions because they want your art. And so how can you work together to make that happen? So for instance, safety is an issue, engineering is an issue, but um, there were sculptures that we brought to private property that didn't have that engineering stamp and that um, they approved because they wanted it there. When we ended up having to put one on City Plaza, we had to have that engineered, and it had never been engineered before, and that was um, Portal of Evolution by Brian Tedrick. So we went backwards. So what we did is we actually had a really high resolution, resolution great photo of it, took it to uh, somebody who could do a CAD drawing, called Brian and said, you know, how, how did this go together, and what bolts did you use, and how did that work, and created this thing kind of backwards, then we went to the city and they said, really what we want engineered is how it's going to attach to the plaza so that we know it's not going to fall over. So they, and it was climbable, and we said, no one's going to climb it because we're going to put a sign that says, do not climb. <laughs> it worked, yeah. So anyway, so, that, so, so lightning's right, but then you know, I'm, I'm encouraging all of you, again, go in there and ask some questions and figure out what exactly needs to be engineered. Fantastic. I mean, and I imagine that that do not climb sign worked much better in Reno than it did than it would on Playa. Um, whether whether no one climbed it, I don't know. But the the rules are a little different depending on where you are, and it's just in terms of social norms as well as other things. I mean, one of the things that I was just talking to an artist about a couple of weeks ago is they were working on a piece in New Orleans, and they had to radically change it because they couldn't get it. They couldn't get the engineer to agree that it could withstand a hurricane force wind. Um, and that's a concern in New Orleans, here in San Francisco, if you're building something longer term, they're going to want it to be able to withstand an earthquake and, you know, um, so it's every, every different process, it, working in a, in a different city is going to be completely different, um, almost as different as working in, in Black Rock City is to, to working here. Um, yeah, so one of the next ways to, um, that's, that's, going to be required in most of these contracts and will protect you as basic as insurance. I mean, we've been, at, you know, at Burning Man Organization, we've been working to try and get insurance agencies that will provide insurance to artists out there so that on the playa, you're not going to, you'll, you'll be protected with, you know, with, with your art. And, you know, even though it's going to be installed in the municipality and the city's going to have insurance, the same way on the playa, Burning Man has insurance, that insurance doesn't extend to, you know, the individual artists. And, and you know, the, I mean, the purpose of insurance is really to spread the risk among the entire community. You know, the, the community not this necessarily being Burning Man, but, the, you know, the municipality, you know, all, you know, all the people. It's just you pay, you know, it's, it's insurance. You're, you're paying just so that you can have that peace of mind. And it's, and, um, you know, the municipalities or private entities are probably going to require the same thing from you. But it's not just going to be liability insurance, that if somebody gets hurt by my artwork, it's going to be, 
um, your engineers are gonna have to have professional liability insurance and, and provide that. To the extent that you're, you, when you're doing your installation stuff, you'll need you know, insurance that's gonna cover your automobiles or any equipment that you're using there. Your subcontractors are all gonna have to provide um, proof of having insurance. And in addition, the municipalities are often require workers' comp. But again, you know, all of these things, it's just, it's just money. It, you know, but you've gotta make sure you, you f calculate, figure out how much that is, add it to your budgets, find, you know, find out what the requirements are gonna be of the particular municipality and, and, you know, and work that in. Um, you know, it's sort of as a subset of, uh, you know, insurance and liability is basically warranties and, in, and indemnity. You know, the indemnity is that, th that um, you're gonna be required to indemnify the municipality or private, private party. Well, I guess you're making warranties. Your first warranties are that um, your artwork, you know, will conform to whatever the basic, um, you know, building requirements are, you know, of workmanship, you know, a warranty of workmanship, a warranty of public safety, um, to the extent that it has moving or operable parts, you'll have a warranty that, um, that it's going to, um, a, a warranty of operability, that everything's gonna operate, you know, and will stand up to, um, you, know, stand, you know, normal wear and tear and weather conditions, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, so to, pr to protect you against any breaches of those warranties, that's what you need, you know, that's, that's part of what your insurance is gonna do. And, Nick? Question in the back. It's, it's gonna be different for the playa um, versus off playa, but um, hopefully we're gonna be able to announce pretty soon that, that we have two programs um, that are specifically set up for artists on playa this year. Um, one is, is created by Heffernan Insurance Brokers, which is the Burning Man's insurance broker. Um, the other is, is uh, secured through a, a nonprofit organization from New York called Fractured Atlas that does a lot of great work with um, this kind of um, slightly less sexy insurance, fundraising, fiscal sponsorship kind of work with um, artists worldwide, and that's a really great organization. Um, so hopefully we're gonna have some information out about that soon for the playa. Um, off playa is a little bit different, um, and I don't have like such a focused list of people to talk to. Probably actually easier to get something for off playa work than on playa work, and um, Fractured Atlas also has a great public art program that, that works for um, any city. Um, so that's also a good place to start there. And I've actually found, again, every city is gonna be different, but I found in Reno that um, the city of Reno, um, we've been doing a lot of projects, or, well, all of our projects actually had gone through BRAF. And so um, between BRAF and uh, the city of Reno, the city of Reno actually gave us grants for some of the temporary sculptures that we did. So between BRAF and the city of Reno, um, the artist and the artist's work was pretty much covered. But that was for a temporary installation. Um, so it's always going to be different. Great. You know, it would be wonderful if we could get just a hair more house lights. I'd really, this, this session and this event is really here for you all. And um, if, if anyone has any questions or any expertise that they'd like to add to the conversation, I really want you to feel welcome to do that. This is a, a open kind of format. Okay. So the next largest area is your intellectual property protection. And that, you know, where it basically comes from is copyright. So you, as the artist, have the, the copyright in, um, you know, the copyright in the piece. And that's, that gives you the, the right to copy the work, distribute it, adapt it, you know, publicly display it. You know, um, and, um, you know, any grant of copyright has to be in writing, otherwise you retain all of those rights. Um, some private entities, when they're contracting with you, they may ask for the copyright. And that basically, if you're giving up the copyright, that means that you give up the right to, you know, to all of those things, which is to, to make copies of it or distribute it or adapt it or, or 
or something. And so that's something as an artist that is hopefully to be avoided as much as possible. And so that basically what, you know, there's a, you know, there's, there's two different kinds of rights. There's the copyright in the work and then there's the physical work itself. If it's a, you know, a painting or a sculpture, if you're actually selling it to someone, all that that person gets is you know, the right to possess that physical copy and to you know, personally display it or display it within whatever parameters that you've granted. But they don't get the right unless you grant it to them you know, to make any copies, to make postcards, to distribute things. I mean, they, they, actually there is an inherent right that comes along with that which is if someone who owns, um, you know, owns some work, uh, you know, a th physical copy of something where you have the copyright, they have the inherent right if they want to sell it to have copies be made in brochures or on websites or, or you know, or the gallery can, you know, can distribute this that's going to be used just for the purpose of trying to sell it. But um, one of the things that, that may, may be discussed, that you, you may be asked for in a lot of the contracts, would be you know, some of the, the rights to, to make copies and be able to distribute, to, you know, to util, utilize two-dimensional copies, you know, in other words, print pictures of it with respect to certain uses other than selling it but, and other than publicizing it. So those things you have to look at carefully and make sure that they're not demanding that you give away too much of the rights in your artwork. I mean, once you give away the copyright, you can't make another copy of it. You can't make an adaptation of it unless you've retained those kinds of rights with respect to it. So it's also worth noting this falls in the area of your representations and warranties and liability. Um, for example, if you made a giant shiny balloon dog for Burning Man, you'd better bet that Jeff Koons's people are going to seriously consider suing you and Burning Man. Right. Um, so our contract asks you to say, this is my work, this is my original work, I'm telling you that this is, you know, I really do have this copyright. Um, so that's another area of liability as well as uh, uh, your rights that you need to protect. And I also have to say that um, we've had a situation in Reno where uh, there's a casino who has a mural contest and they give the mural artists um, that they choose, um, I don't know, a stipend or whatever. Um, but that, that, I'm also on the Public Art Committee and uh, the City of Reno's Arts and Culture Commission, and the casino actually keeps copyright of those images and uses them for T-shirts, posters, whatever. And, and we're fighting that, but it's not, you know, it's up to the individual artist to say, no, you know, I will not participate in this. Um, so again, you really have to be very, very careful about what you're signing. Yeah. So then there's an another protection that uh, you as artists have is under the Visual Artists' Rights, Rights Act. And that basically, you know, the rights may or may not apply, but it's basically about alterations of, of art. But it, ba it essentially grants the following rights. The right to prevent intentional distortion, mutilation, or other modification of the work, but that has a proviso which would be prejudicial to his or her honor or reputation. Okay, and there's also the right to prevent the destruction of a work, but there's a proviso to that. It has to be of recognized stature. And then there's also a right of attribution, which allows the artist to either, if, an, if the artwork is altered in any way, to either claim or deny attribution. Um, so, I mean, essentially what, um, you know, what, what, what that basically means is, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's sort of obvious what it means. If that for some reason they don't like what the artwork is, they want to hang it a different way. They want to, you know, there are any changes that the owner or the entity wants to make to it. They, um, they are not permitted to do it if it would uh, be uh, prejudicial to your reputation, or uh, or there's an absolute prohibition if it's in um, an artwork of recognized stature. Uh, but un unfortunately, all of these rights are allowed to be waived. So you'll find in most contracts that there's going to be a, a waiver provision that says 
well, we retain the right for, I mean, there's some reasons why this might, might be placed. You'll notice in the Burning Man contract, there is a small waiver of um, the, the VARA rights, but that's a waiver if there's an emergency, there's some public safety issue or something, we might have to go in and do something to that artwork right away for you know, a public safety thing. You waive, you waive your, your right with respect to that. But you'll find in the outside world that the contracts are gonna waive VARA rights and it will, it will delineate a number of these things such as you know, public safety or damage or other things like that. But then it will say, or any other reason. I have another reason. <laughs> so with Portal of Evolution, which was the giant butterfly, so remember, you could climb it. And when it was a temporary installation, we had the do not climb sign. And uh, that was not effective. So the city ended up purchasing that sculpture. And um, they wanted Brian to, um, there were like footholds. I don't know if you all remember the sculpture. But there were footholds so that you could climb up to where the butterfly was. They wanted, they wanted to strip those footholds. So this is a sculpture that had already been out for many years, so it was rusty. And Brian said it would look scarred. And it would have looked scarred. And, it, and so we fought it and just said no. And the artist said no. And the city said okay. So you can fight back. So sort of the, the summary for you know, your intellectual property rights is essentially um, you should, you know, always fight to retain the copyright. I mean, if it's just, you know, a temporary display, they're not going to, they're not, not going to ask you for the copyright, but in private parties sometimes do. But, you know, make sure you retain the copyright as much as possible. You sh the entity is probably going to request the rights to make some two-dimensional reproductions for advertising purposes. And that's, I mean, that's okay, but try and limit it as much as possible. Uh, perhaps the entity is going to request additional rights, such as, um, you know, to make tote bags or coffee cups or other things that have the image on it. And, you know, that's sort of getting into the area of commercialization of it. And, you know, should you be, is, I mean, is that okay? And, um, you know, without providing additional compensation to you, because that's generally what they, um, what they ask for, and it's really up to whatever you can, what they're demanding and what you can negotiate. Um, and then there's, there's the moral rights waiver, which will be in there, and again, pay attention and try and make sure that the moral rights waiver is as limited as possible. Um, a, a, another issue is about credit, which is, um, you know, make sure that the contract provides that whenever they're publishing anything about the artwork, that they give you credit as the as the artist. I mean, as, or if you, I mean, in particular, if they're ever having images of the artwork, that you should be appropriately credited. Uh, and then sometimes there's issues with respect to pu publicity. I know the city of San Francisco generally likes to request that before you have any publicity about this, that you send it to us and you know, and get our prior written consent. And again, that's something where, you know, you try and limit that restriction as much as possible so that you, that there are some things that are already approved of in the contract that you can send out. So, um, I guess next we would, well, payment, which is, you know, a, well, are there any more questions yeah, on intellectual questions. property? Why don't we? It's called the Visual Artists uh, Rights Act, and it was it was part of one of these copyright bills that Congress passes it's, from time to time uh, yeah. that was was added onto. It was passed in 1990. It's Section 106A of the Copyright Act. Okay, there is a similar act here in in California, the uh, sort of the California Art Preservation Act, which you know, provides that whenever there's a resale of a piece, uh, you know, of, of some artwork that the artist will get part of a, you know, a commission on it. But again, that's a right that, that can be waived as well. And so you'll see that come up um, in, in various contracts. Um, any, any other intellectual property questions?
We, yeah. So, well, hey, let me give you, why don't you. Okay, so uh, what I was going to say, just because I work with the self funded artist, um, when that question comes up, the self funded artist will generally ask me if we have insurance and they'll deal with it individually. They're not required to. Um, so that's why it never came up probably with your, with our conversation. It, it's not necessarily Burning Man's position that everyone should have insurance, but that everyone should think soberly about what the live, the risks that they're taking on are um, and how they might want to look at managing them. Yeah. You may already have insurance if you own a home or if you have a renter's insurance policy. That might cover you for some you know, artwork that you put up on, on the playa. Um, but you know, it depends on you know, on what, on what kind of damage can happen to someone because of your artwork. But, you know, in er earlier years on the playa, I mean, there was, I, I mean, there have been very few lawsuits that I'm aware of that have been against artists for injuries that happen at the playa. And I think a lot of that is basically because of the assumption of the risk doctrine and the language that we have on the back of, of the ticket, but um, you know it's, it doesn't protect you against claims that there might be. Somebody gets injured on some piece of artwork. It's a, a, something that spins around, and somebody falls off and said, you know, it was engineered wrong or it went too fast. Or there was another artwork where people could climb up into it, and someone fell off. And I, I, they never filed a lawsuit, but they made claims. You know, with respect to that. So you just sort of have to look at what's, you know, what's the potential liability that you have. If it's a smaller piece, your liability might be it might fall over or somebody could get hurt. And it's not. Not on my watch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I mean, my personal recommendation is try and get insurance as much as possible. It, it actually, you know, in the scheme of things, it doesn't cost that much. And it's, you know, where it's really helpful is, you know, just as, even if someone makes a claim and they've got no basis for it whatsoever, your insurance is going to protect you with respect to, you know, any legal fees that you might have with respect to that. Presumably that artist is only up for a short time, so it's time bound. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Less time for things to rust and wear and fail, yeah. Copyrighted, but if I do a sculpture and put it in the playa, how would people know that it's copyrighted? Well, it, well, first of all, you don't. It, it used to be that you had to write, put the copyright symbol on something, and do that. You don't have to do that anymore. You do. You have a copyright just from the moment of creating the artwork. However, you don't have protections under the Copyright Act um, unless you've you've filed something with the Copyright Office. And actually, that's a, a recommendation that that I, you know, I'll make. You know, I, 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 as I'm making this rep, this recommendation, I have to point out shame shamefully that, for example, the artworks that you know I've done with Greg, I've never filed the copyright applications to copyright them, and I'm going to do that tomorrow as soon as I get to the office. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's very simple to file a copyright application. You just take, you know, your picture of it. You know, you, I mean, there's other things you have to f fill out correctly, but it's basically ship it off to the copyright office. But until you've actually registered your copyright, you don't have the protections. While you could sue someone for copyright infringement, you don't have the protections, which is that you'll, you can get attorney's fees if you win. And attorney's fees are usually in copyright... Uh, infringement actions are usually what the kicker is because it's hard for you to prove how you've been damaged by somebody doing it or, or if you have been it hasn't been for that much that much money but if you can get attorney's fees at the end that that's what causes people to to comply or take take down the offending usage or whatever um, and this has been a real issue. There was an incident a couple of years ago where on stage at a major music award, there was what, at least to the artist, appeared to be a copy of their work from Burning Man um, appearing next to a, a live music act they had not authorized. Um, and 
you know, I, I don't know exact 100% how that worked out, but the, the, the protections that you have are increased if you go ahead and file that copyright. So, so definitely something to consider doing. We're pretty, pretty near to the end of our time, um, so I'd love to get any more questions that folks have. Yes, go ahead. Just very briefly, any thoughts on entity creation for protection of the artist? Um, obviously, when you're taking sums of monies in grants, you've got not contractors, etc. Doing it as an individual um, has some inherent risk because there's no protection to you. But what do you think about forming an entity or an artist collective, and any recommendations around that? Well, I mean, I, I mean, it depends on the scope of the liability that there may be, but I pretty much always recommend that you do it with, res with respect to some entity. An LLC is the easiest one to form, but there's ongoing expenses every year. You have to pay $800 to the, um, you know, to the state for that. You have to file, you know, get separate in income tax returns that are filed with respect to it. So you end up, uh, you, you know, you, you have to have a, an agent for service of process and things like that. Your cost ends up being about at least twelve hundred dollars just for, you know, paying the franchise tax board. It's eight hundred dollars and paying for a tax return, but that also gives you a lot of protection, you know, you know, with respect to personal liability. I was talking to an artist the other day who was saying that they looked at creating an LLC for their piece, but ultimately decided they could get a really pretty good insurance policy for cheaper than the cost that they would have putting together the LLC, and they decided to prioritize that. Whether that's the right decision, I don't know, but it's some, something to consider. There's some real cost associated with that, but it can, can really help you, particularly where you have multiple people involved in something. Sure. Um, let's maybe take this question, and then I can speak briefly about that program. So what about parity? Isn't parity not covered under, like it, because I worked on, um, I've been on the peer group for a few years, and I know that Taco Bell had done a commercial and used uh, some of Matt Schultz's artwork, and he went to go look into seeing what he could do to cover himself, and parody was not, you can't sue if it's a parody. And that's, was it Taco Bell or a soda? I don't remember which. Quiznos, maybe. The Quiznos, yeah. It was a sandwich company, and they <coughs> blatantly used his artwork. Yeah, um, I mean, there is a specific exemption from that. I mean, it doesn't mean that you can't sue, but it means well, that you might not successfully. I mean, with parody, I mean, just uh, parody is part of the, the fair use doctrine under the Copyright Act, which allows, you know, which allows you to use, um, you know, a, if you're using it for some, you know, anyway, there are four factors under fair use, which is sort of the nature and character of the use, whether it's, uh, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount or substantiality uh, of the portion that's used, and whether that affects the market for the value of the work. That, those are the fair use factors. So that if something is used, um, sort of, for, for example, to comment on the artwork or something, you know, there's going to be, you know, some critical artistic discussion. They can show a picture of it. They could, you know, discuss some things about it. But just for just what, what, just what's sufficient for, for that purpose. Now, parody is a slightly different portion of that, but then you have to actually be parodying the artwork itself. If you're just doing a general parody of Burning Man, for example, which is what Quiznos was doing, but they're not parodying the artwork, then it's, um, that's not a valid defense to a copyright infringement claim in that situation. So I, th I think I should jump in. Kim wanted me to mention the fiscal sponsorship program that we have, or it's also just generally a tool that's available for you for fundraising where you can sign on with a nonprofit um, and more complicated than this, but use their nonprofit status to raise money that's tax deductible to the donors to get family foundation and donor advised fund money. Um, that's a pro we have a, a small program offering that, particularly to apply artists, but also to others uh, in Burning Man. There's some other fiscal sponsors out there you can use. Um, so um, find me personally after if you're interested in that. Um, but the gentleman in the purple shirt there also had a question. Todd Colgrove, just a quick uh, comment regarding uh, fair use and 
and registering for a copyright and any of that support. If you're not familiar with it, uh, in every state, you've got a patent and trademark resource center. Here in San Francisco, as an example, the San Francisco Public Library is one. And they have backbones of pure steel and will be delighted to help you in terms of figuring out whether or not you want to submit this paperwork to, to get the copyright protections without going necessarily to an attorney. In Nevada, it's uh, the University of Nevada, Reno. So come on by. Those librarians will be delighted to help you. Wonderful. Thank you for that information. Any other questions or comments? We have just a couple minutes left. Yes, there in the back. Where do you fall in terms of like build side insurance? So the, the question is, um, is insurance needed or, or available for your build site? What if it's kind of informal, like you're just doing it in your garage? Well, I'll just give you the example. We've gotten insurance, for example, through Heffern and for some of our on plier projects. We get it to include, you know, the build site as well. You know, we extend it out to cover those, those periods. You know, at your request, you know, would, would, so would your volunteers be covered, especially when they're doing a driving run to get supplies or something? I would hope so. It, it <laughs> depends on the policy, and it's definitely something, if you're, if you're buying an insurance policy, something to ask the broker about. Um, you know, in the case of a, of a volunteer driving a vehicle, um, vehicle insurance is largely going to be separate from the kind of art insurance that we're talking about buying, that hopefully that vehicle's already insured, and, and that, that gives you some coverage, but that's not going to be under that policy. Uh, we've got a couple questions there in the back. So uh, this would be like IP question. Just because this has come up in the last couple of months at different Burning Man events I've been at, there was a homage to uh, Duchamp, I think his name is, the urinal back in 2003. How, how is it different, what, 13 years ago than today to do something like that with regards to what Eli said about doing a large shiny balloon on the playa? Has it changed in the last 13 years or because we're more well known as an event or could somebody do homage like that today? Well, I think Marshal Deschamps copyright has expired by now. <laughs> so with respect to some of those older things, I think that that's perfectly okay right now. But, you know, it's the same thing. If you're trying to use somebody else's artwork and do a derivative copy, you're infringing their copyright unless it's satirical or it's a parody and you're using only enough sufficient to, to do that parody. I mean, the Marcel Duchamp fountain being, you know, the first decade of the 20th century, I think is, I, I don't know that that copyright has expired. It might, might just be that Burning Man was lower profile then. Um, I don't know. Maybe that was a, a, a fair use parody. So I, I just got the notice that we've reached the end of our time. Um, I'm certainly available for more one-on-one -on -one discussion, as I imagine the panelists are as well. Thank you all so much.